What is up, everyone? Welcome to A Sum of Two Buses. Today, we're going to talk about the basics of automation. Automation? What's that? Sounds boring. It's not, I assure you. When I say automation, I'm generally talking about programming scenes that contain song-specific changes. This can range from many small changes to many large changes all happening at a push of a button. Programming these changes can be very helpful for making predetermined mix changes between songs in a very minimal amount of time, allowing you to really dial in your mix. These changes can vary from small things like automating reverbs or delay settings to even automating EQ and playback levels or even muting input channels that aren't relevant to the song. Is automation really this important? Oh, it's important, all right. Mute automation alone is a lifesaver, but you have to be careful with this, obviously. But what happens when there's so many blackouts between songs, you can't see what's happening. Being able to mute for guitar changes or muting instruments that aren't being used can be a lifesaver for keeping a clean show. I mean, come on, we only have two hands. I don't know, automation sounds scary. Oh, it can be, and I'm definitely not here telling you to try this on your next gig. This is definitely something that you should practice first. Offline editors are great for this. You can really dig in and make sure that what you want to happen is actually happening. I would also suggest studying the manual of your console to really understand as much as you can about the automation section of your console. Now, all consoles handle automation differently, but there are common themes. Today, we'll be checking out how I handle automation in the DLive, and I'll try to keep it somewhat general so you can apply this on different platforms as well. So let's start by talking about file management. I generally like the master file or the show file to be artist and date specific. Every performance the artist does has a dedicated show file, and I usually try to put the date in the file name. That way I always have the ability to go back in time. Remember, I also record and review shows at a later date, so if something sounded really good and somehow I deviated from that sound in my current show, I can always go back and reference that old show file to see what I was doing. Maybe even make a preset from the old show file to import into my current show file. Now let's talk about scenes. In the DLive platform, there are 500 scenes for every show file. I like to use these scenes for various things like I.O. routing presets, strip design presets, guest consoles, guest engineers, all saves, waves insert bypass, and waves insert engaged, and lastly, song presets. And if you look, each scene has a description box where you can write any notes you need to write about your scene. You also have the ability to lock your scene to prevent any unwanted overwrites. Inside the scene manager, there's something called a recall filter. It does exactly what you think it should do. It filters out what it will recall when you fire the scene. As you can see, there are a lot of options to automate. That still sounds scary. Don't be afraid. It does seem overwhelming, but I have a simple and easy tip for you. Just start by hitting the block all button and this blocks anything from recalling in the scene. Now that everything is read, go through all the parameters and choose what you want this scene to recall. It's as easy as that, but be sure to hit apply before you exit and you just started automating. Let's talk a little bit about show flow. Much like other consoles, you have a queue list or an order of scenes for a show. If you hit the queue list editor, you can go through and make a playlist of scenes, so to speak, of scenes for your show. You can even save presets of different cue lists in this section. For example, I have a one hour show, a 45 minute set, and various different festival cue list presets. So now we have a show which has scenes, and then we have a cue list which is in order of those scenes. Let's explore a little deeper how I have my scenes set up for the actual show. My show starts with two all save options at the top of the cue list. By all save, I mean there are no filters for these scenes because they save all the settings of the desk in its current state. The first scene is a start show PA tune scene. I usually use this scene to save right after I tune the PA. The second is called a post check save. This is meant to capture the state of the desk right after sound check. Then this is the scene I would use to start my performance of that night. Now on to the fun stuff, song scenes. Personally, I have a rule for these scenes. I always keep the recall filters for all song scenes identical. Why would you do that? Well, call me crazy, but when it comes to song scenes, I either automate it for the whole show or I don't automate it at all. And I keep to this philosophy because updating a parameter throughout your show is risky enough. But when you have different song scenes recalling different parameters at different times, it can get very destructive and sometimes confusing to keep up with, especially when the set list changes. Again, why? 
Okay, let me try to explain. Say you wanted to automate the gate on your kick to open for this song too. So you open the gate, go to your scene, song two, recall filter, block all, right? All red, hit gate, apply, and then you store. When you fire this scene, it's gonna recall the gate in its current state, which is out. That's what we wanted, right? But if you don't add this parameter to all your recall filters for all your song scenes, then when you fire the next song scene, your gate will continue to be open because the rest of your scenes have filtered that out for recall. Now maybe some of you think, well you could just automate the following song scene to close the gate again and leave all the rest of the song scenes the same. Well you could do that and it would work for the show, but if the band changes the set list and you don't remember to reprogram the following scene, it could be a painful next show. See what I mean? So what do you automate? Well, that's kind of a loaded question. I think most engineers agree you should only automate what you need to automate. For Billy's show, a lot of sounds change a lot from song to song. Creative kick sounds from the record, different electronic drum sounds in place of the acoustic drums, to different changes in Finn's world. Now, Finn's world is dense with possibilities and pretty lean input-wise when you think about what he's got going on there. He has a stereo synth, a stereo guitar, stereo SPD, and stereo bass lines, which all pass through his main stage rig using a lot of the presets from their records. His main stage rig is even getting MIDI messages to change from song to song, and sometimes even within the song. In addition to all of those instruments, he also has a Nord for his piano sounds that is also receiving MIDI changes. So needless to say, there's a lot of different sounds coming at me that change pretty frequently. So I ended up automating most of his world. I'm sure it sounds crazy, but when you get used to it, it's very liberating to be able to adjust ever-changing sounds to make sure everything is balanced in that particular song. I also automate playback. This is huge. Let's face it, we work in a fast-paced environment that doesn't always yield the time for us to make everything perfect. Being able to make playback consistent from song to song is a lifesaver. It can definitely take your show to the next level. And as you might have guessed, I also automate my effects. I set my first eight effects engines to automate from song to song. And I have one static effects unit, which is my drum room, that stays static for the show. I have a handful of input channels where I automate the sends to those reverb units. I also automate my strip design from song to song. Yeah, I know, straight up lazy. But I formed kind of a habit of bringing certain faders up to the bass level when I was on a 1500, and it really kind of grew on me. The last thing I automate in this show are my mutes. Like I said before, we have a lot of blackouts, intros, outros, and whatnot. It just makes life easier. And when I'm talking about mutes, I'm talking about most of my stage inputs, except for Billy's vocal. All of her vocals remain static for the entire show. You sound insane. I know, I know. But when you focus on consistency and tuning your PA, and you know how your mix sounds, all of this might seem a little bit more doable. So now that I sound insane apparently, let's talk about what I don't automate in my song scenes. Like I said before, I don't automate Billy's vocal mic at all. And I also don't automate Finn's vocal mic for the most part. I only automate the mute for his vocal. I don't automate anything on my main mix or my matrix outputs. I don't automate acoustic drums. I find this to be a slippery slope because drums can sound different from room to room. I also think if they sound good during sound check, I'm sure they'll be fine for the entire show. I also don't automate the levels or the EQ of my effects returns for the same reason as the drums. I think an acoustic space can change how our effects sound. I do, however, automate the EQ sending into my reverb. I find this more of a creative EQ to make the effects do what I want it to do. Now, like I said, Tread lightly with all of this, and only try things that you feel comfortable with. I would suggest starting the same way that I did. Start with automating your effects from song to song. It's super easy and super low key. And even automating effects alone can really make things fun and creative for your show. Once you start doing this, you'll get the hang of how automation works. Maybe you'll overwrite some songs, and maybe you'll learn how not to overwrite some songs. And making these mistakes with effects is way less noticeable. Then maybe you can start to explore how to update your scenes. Update scenes? Yes, sometimes in life, things don't go the way we planned. Or sometimes things change. Shocker, I know. And if we're automating that particular something, then we would need to update all of our scenes to its current and desired state. Fun times. But don't worry. It's not as bad as it seems on this desk. But first, start by storing your scene, storing your show, 
and exporting it to a flash drive just to be safe. Now click the update tab and select the scenes that you want to update. I usually go for a manual scope then choose the parameter or parameters that you want to update for these particular scenes. For safety I would recommend hitting the update none to make sure that your scope is clear. Now select the desired parameters and hit close. Now you're going to want to choose what mode that you're going to update in. Absolute mode will take the current state of that parameter and save it to all the selected scenes in its current state. Relative mode would be geared for more of a relative change between all the scenes. Hit apply and boom, you're updated. Okay, the last thing we're going to hit on are global safes. Just like it sounds, it's a way to globally safe a parameter across your entire show file. It's also a great way to protect yourself from any show-stopping scene misfires. So let's hit the Global Scenes tab. And as you can see, it looks a lot like our recall filter in our Scene Manager page. I would set this up in the exact same fashion. I would hit either Safe All or Safe None, then manually choose what parameters to safe or unsafe. See, that wasn't so bad. Speak for yourself. Once you get the hang of automation, it can be a pretty interesting tool. I mean, automation has made every demonstration in this little show of mine possible. It could also be a great way of saving presets for things like I.O., safety switches for bypassing external processing, and even ways to remap the console based on your current configuration. So I hope this was able to shed some light on a heavy subject. I know automation can seem like a scary thing, but I do think it's something that could spark a lot of creativity in our shows and get us that much closer to our ever elusive perfect show. Be sure to tune in next episode when we tackle the beast of manual delay compensation. Well, that's it for this episode of A Sum of Two Buses. If you dug it, please like, please share, and please subscribe. Until next time, take care and be safe. Yeah,